My name is Lisa McMullen. Today is Thursday, November 10th, 2011. I am in the George Southern Archives located on Utah Valley University. I am interviewing Mrs. Willa Derrick who resides in St. George, Utah. Mrs. Willa Derrick is the daughter of Juanita Brooks. We will be discussing Juanita's life and her contributions to the state of Utah. For clarification, each time the church is mentioned by Mrs. Derrick or me, we are referring to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right, so Mrs. Derrick, tell me about your family life. We had an interesting family life. Um, I grew up in a yours, mine, and our family. My father had four sons, my mother had one son, and they married each other and uh, had four of us in very rapid concession, uh, succession. And uh, the older boys were not happy about it and uh, came in at the birth of the last child and told them that was enough. <laughs> that, they, uh, that people in town were talking about them and at their age that they were having such a, a large family. So they, uh, they successfully blended that family, which is a great tribute. It is to my mother. She, I asked her uh, later on in my life how she managed to do that, and she said I had one blind eye and one deaf ear, and so I was able to uh, to handle this. I just didn't let things bother me. So wow, yeah, it's great. Thank you. So, what did your mother do before she was married? Did she work? Did, what, what did she do? Well, um, you know, she married her first husband fairly young, completed her education, and taught school, and uh, was left a widow uh, with a tiny baby boy, uh, and not very good relationship with her in-laws, and so she uh, made it a point then to go back to college. I was able to accomplish that with the help of her siblings, uh, tending the baby or her, or her grandparents, and uh, get her degree. And then she was able to get a job at, at Dixie College, where she worked for a number of years before she met and married my husband. So I guess it, you could say that, that she did work. And uh, uh, after her, she lost her first husband and uh, before she met my father. And of course, she continued even after she married my dad. To, to teach English? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. to teach. Uh, she, didn't, she didn't run away, but she did. Uh, all the time I was growing up, she taught school. Okay. Was she a tough teacher? Oh, yes. <laughs> she, <laughs> she was a very tough teacher. You may have read the story in the book about my brother. Uh, who took a class from her, and uh, when he went to get his report card, he gave, she gave him a C, and she said, he said to her, Mother, you know, why did you give me a C? And she said, because I didn't want to have to give you a D. <laughs> so she was, she was known as a, as a fair teacher, but, but difficult. She, uh, she was an excellent teacher. Oh, I bet. She was an excellent teacher. Oh, okay. She was also an excellent public speaker. She, uh, she did a lot of speaking and was in demand as a public speaker. Um, Thank you. I did read that. I did read about all her public speaking. Yeah. So how was your mother able to write books, raise a family, and fulfill church callings? I know she's had some heavy-duty church callings. She did have some heavy-duty church callings. How could she calling. do it so successfully? So she do it? You know, just recently, we had a celebration in St. George, and they did a, a list of the State Creed Society presidents from the beginning of the St. George, Utah State. And, and I looked at that, and she was the State Creed Society president from 1933 to 1939, and those were the years that all four of us were being born. And, and so I, I was quite amazed when I thought about that. But, I think one of the really great reasons why she was so successful was because of my father. My father was very, very supportive to her in every way, in every, every way. And another thing was that she was able to get along without very much sleep. 
um, we would wake up at night as children and hear the typewriter clacking in the kitchen and you know she only had one of those old-fashioned I don't know how she ever ever did it no way to correct a mistake or <laughs> anything and uh, but we would hear the typewriter going and then when she was doing research she would get on the the bus at night and travel all night and then do her business while we were at school and then come home and uh, and like I said my father provided the stability and uh, and made it so that she could do the things that she did I, I really think that that was a, one of the great things that made it possible for her oh thank you so how has your mother influenced your life well, probably in every way that and my mother ever does. Um, she was not a really very good cook, and uh, I've become a good cook. So, <laughs> so that uh, that but but she was so busy with other things, uh, and she trained us to uh, to clean the house too, and she made it a game, and. Uh, we had a very large, long kitchen with a linoleum floor. And so when it was time to polish the floor, she would put uh, socks on all of us and we would skate on the floor to polish the floor. And, uh, and we, you know, we all had our assigned, assigned jobs. Uh, she was never satisfied with mediocrity. She expected all of us to excel in school. Um, we were supposed to get good grades and we were supposed to get an education. None of us ever thought that we could stop when we graduated from high school. Uh, it was just a done deal that uh, we went to college. And so, you know, in that way, um, and I appreciated the excellent teacher that she was. And so I thought the teaching was a great profession and so I chose that also for my my life and I I thought that the way she treated my brothers and me as we were growing up uh, probably influenced the way that I tried to teach my own children uh, she was always an example people thought maybe that she might have been influenced uh, by the church when her book came out but she was always active, always active. Uh, there was never a question about whether we went to church or not. When you're talking about the book, that was the Mountain Meadows yes, Massacre. Mountain Meadow. mm -hmm. Was she Relief Society president when it came out, or? Oh no. Okay, no, that was later. No, she was. She was a stake Relief Society president see, during the early years of okay. of my of her marriage to my dad because that's when she was having all those children. <laughs> I don't, I really don't know how she did it. No. And, and then she had the three teenage boys in the home and uh, and her own son when he came. So there were four of them, four teenage boys besides him. Was she amazing that she was able to do all that she did. It, it, it really is. And so well. And so well. She did it and, and did so it so well. She was an extremely unusual person. She was extremely unusual very, very down to earth, and yet so brilliant, so brilliant, she really was. And I believe that she was born ahead of her time. You know, women in those days just didn't do the things that she did. And she was very quiet about it though. And you probably have read about her having the ironing board covered in the kitchen. And, and if anybody would come, she'd cover the typewriter and start to iron. And so that they they didn't know that she was doing things. And my brother went downtown one time and somebody said to him, oh, I heard your mother's writing a book. And he said, she is not. <laughs> so as children, we were not, not really aware, except that we could hear the typewriter and that we knew that she took trips. So. Wonderful. Many of our family vacations were her research trips. To up to Utah or to California? Oh, everywhere, everywhere. And a dad would take us and on the lawn of some big building and we'd play while she would go in to do her research. So that was, uh, we thought we were on vacation. That's perfect. 
So we've just talked about how your mother has influenced your life. What would be, of all the things that you learned from her, what do you think would be the most valuable if you could name just one thing? That, that is really difficult. Um, some things that people don't know about her is that she was extremely compassionate and especially kind. And uh, I watched her as a child growing up. We had an old lady that lived across the street from us that had never married. And she couldn't walk. She'd scoot on the floor and she had wild hair and she was scary. We were scared to death of her. And my mother sent us every meal to take food to this little old lady. Wow. And uh, I would be so scared. I'd take it to the door, leave it in the door and run because you know, she looked like a, a witch, and she was just a poor little old soul. But uh, for years, until she died, we took food over to her across the street for three meals a day. And uh, I watched her also with neighbors and less fortunate people, and, and the stories of, of her activities with her own siblings. Um, she was a great example of compassion and caring and and um, and also the desire for learning I mean it's hard to name one thing I bet <laughs> if you can't that's awesome that's, that's great. great but I but she and those are things that people didn't know about her is that she was extremely compassionate and kind and aware of the needs of others thank you what is one of your fondest memories of your mom Oh my goodness. Um, or two or three. I, I don't know if it would be the fondest or not. <laughs> As a teenage girl, I was very social and enjoyed a lot of things. And, and we, uh, I was with a group of kids one night who went down across the river in an old car and were just messing around, you know. And we didn't realize it had gotten so late. And um, this old car, we lived on the top of of the hill, and this cold car wouldn't make it up the hill frontwards. So the kids driving turned around, and we went up the hill in reverse, laughing and squealing all the way. And uh, when I got to the door, Mother was waiting for me, and uh, and it was very late, and I didn't know it was very late. We had it, and she said to me, "I think the very worst thing I could hope for you." is that you have a daughter just like you. <laughs> and uh, that stuck with me. <laughs> I, um, I didn't realize it was late, and I didn't think about her worrying. And, and uh, that, was, that was kind of a wake-up call. That's a nice memory. And I don't, I, you know, there, there are a lot of, of great memories, but that's one that I, I really do remember. Oh, good. Thank you. I know you mentioned that your mother was extremely compassionate and extremely caring. Um, what other qualities did she have? I, I remember reading in her biography that she seemed she was so generous with her siblings about paying for their school. She, what other she great was, qualities uh, did she her have? Siblings. In fact, I brought this little book to show you. It's called The Caring Sister, and her siblings wanted it to be put in uh, quicksand and cactus, but the book was published before they got it. But each of them wrote the story about what she had done individually for them in their lives and the difference that she made. She basically was mostly the mother to the younger children. Yeah. And uh, I mean, very, very touching stories. I. Um, <clears throat> She bought my one uncle a trumpet uh, that his parents couldn't get for him. And, and my one aunt was graduating from high school and she couldn't have a new dress because she'd had one for Christmas. And, uh, and so she didn't have a new dress. And mother showed up the night of the graduation. Basically crying with the most beautiful dress, the most beautiful dress I had at this year that she had ever seen and she said she felt a little bit bad because she had told her friend that she wasn't going to have a new dress but she said uh, 
There she was, the most gorgeous dress I've ever seen. A white crepe de chine, real thick silk, lavishly beaded with tiny pearls on the bodice and around the single roll of pillars around the neckline and the skull of Turk. I was speechless, almost in a state of shock. It was a dream dress beyond my wildest imaginings. And then she said that Mother also bought tubs of sweet peas to decorate the stage. Oh, wow. Because, you know, down in Bunkerville, they didn't have any flowers or anything. She said, I have my aunt said, she paid the unheard of price, $18 for that dress. And she said, but today you couldn't touch it for 250 so. Wow. so and, and that's just, she said, that was typical of Juanita. She always sensed your wants and needs, and without a word ever being said, how we all loved her. Her greatest joy seemed to be in doing things for others. And she and my uncle were married. They'd already had four weddings that year in the family, and so that anyway, so mother gave them a big party because the folks couldn't do it. And I mean, oh, it's uh, my one aunt. She supported on a mission, I and mean, when she came home, she needed a new coat, and so mother bought her a new coat and then wore her old one. I read that. And so uh, anyway, she. Uh, she was really unusual in her awareness of other people and and their needs and uh, and how to help them. Her, she was the oldest of ten, and her brothers and sisters all loved her. Loved her, uh, and the younger would say that she was really their mother who taught them. And she scolded them and she, uh, you know, made them uh, do things that they should. And she saw that all of them got to college. Yes. Except my one, the youngest aunt got married at 17. And so mother went away on a trip and let them have her house for their honeymoon. Oh, wow. So, so she, uh, anyway, I, uh, I put this together last year, uh, no, in 2007, it seemed like last year, uh, and gave it to each of my siblings and each of our children so that they would, they would be able to have a little bit different look ab about her. That's amazing. It's called The Caring Sister. Well, yes, and, and uh, we just put it together. My, my Aunt Eva is the one who, who wrote it and, and uh, I mean, who got the, the got it and compiled it, and so she just said we had wanted to have these stories printed in quicksand and cactus, but they were left out. We were sick with disappointment, so I'm going. To, so she said she will copy them there. So I have copied them and, and uh, given them to my oh my children and to my my siblings and uh, and a lot of even the nieces and nephews who wanted it. And interesting thing, my <clears throat> my dad's family, by his first wife, all consider her their grandmother because of course she has all the years. And the little boys in school, great grandchildren, several of them are doing reports on Grandma Brooks or Grandpa Brooks too, because he had <clears throat> they're doing studying early history I guess and so uh, one of them called the other day and uh, actually, there have been three of them that are doing them in the elementary school this year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he was the sheriff, is that right? Was your My dad, dad was, was the, the sheriff. sheriff? Uh -huh. And then after he was the sheriff, he was a postmaster. Okay. And, you know, for a long time, I thought Santa Claus left everything at the post office. Because <laughs> 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 uh, he was the postmaster uh, for a long time and then when he retired, we were all still young. He was 57 when my youngest brother was born. And so, uh, so you know, our parents were older, and uh, but we never knew it. I, mean, I didn't realize growing up that my parents were a lot older than everybody else's parents. He was, he was very, very young at heart, and uh, and a really fun dad. But, but he was, they were, he was 17 years older than mother, and. Uh, but he was 57 when my mother's brother was born. So they came, the IRS came and when he was in his 70s to see how come he had so many little deductions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
would you allow us to copy your your book? Are you comfortable with that? Can we make a copy? Oh yeah, that would, would be that fine. be okay? That would be fine if you want. If that's we okay, would love that. I would love to keep read that keep that talking, and I'll just run and do it so you don't have to wait. That would be great. Yeah, if if you don't do that right now. thank you. No, so nice. I, the more I learn, your mother is just so amazing. I, I'm I'm going to meet her. She really is. She really was amazing. I. I just don't know how she did that. I don't either. And Levi Peterson, when he ended his interview, he said, I want to say something. She was my hero to begin with, and when I finished writing the biography, she was still my hero. Yeah. 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 So, and you know, the, the things that everybody else looks at as, as why she's so important or not, the things that we remember or that we knew, and, and of course, uh, she was an outstanding teacher as well, and there are many, many of her students that will attest to that. Oh, I bet. Uh, they really helped. She helped them find majors that they were interested in, helped them get uh, to college and find scholarships and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, so. Oh, wonderful. I've kind of a tickle near my throat. I better <laughs> okay. have a drink. Okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in our phone conversation that your mother was in the Beehive Hall of Fame. Right. I, I haven't heard of that. What, how did that come about? Do you know what? I don't know. I found it in Levi's book, uh, but it doesn't give a date. And uh, I went online last night to see if I could find it. It's, it's in the Marriott Hotel in Salt Lake mm -hmm. City, and she and Eliza R. Snow are the only two women. Uh, at, at least at that time that mm -hmm. were there, I haven't checked lately. And so I put Beehive Hall of Fame, Marriott Hotel, Salt Lake City, I put all kinds of things, and I, all that came up was her Hall of Fame in, at Dixie State. She's in the Hall of Fame at Dixie State College as well. And so uh, I really don't know um, how that came. I could not find anything about it, and I went through I tried all kinds of things on the internet, and, and Levi has it in his book. I don't know. Did you see it in his book? I, I must. I've read the book, but I must not remember that. I, I marked some of these things because you were asking me about. But it says, <clears throat> oh no, well, that's when she was losing it. Um, talking about. Her. Well, maybe I can't find it. Uh, I saw it this morning coming up in the car, and I should have just left that uh, uh, mark in there. It, all, all it just said was that, uh, oh, here it is. On April 23rd, 1981, she attended the Emeritus Club luncheon as a recipient of one of two awards of the organization made each year to members who had distinguished themselves. Her citation read, her commitment to probe and inquire in order to tell the truth, to narrate and interpret history honestly, made it easier for fellow Mormon scholars to pursue church-related history more objectively. On January 4, 1985, Juanita's name was entered into the Beehive Hall of Fame among the names of illustrious politicians, business persons, scientists, inventors, and athletes who were, the, for the most part, men. Inscribed on the plaque in, on display in the foyer of the Marriott Hotel in Salt Lake City was a citation calling her the Dean of Utah Historians. Wow. So. Uh, that's, I have been there and seen it, but it's been a number of years. And, uh, and so, and I did know that there were the, <clears throat> only the two women. Up there. Up okay. there, uh-huh. So uh, when we go to a conference next time, we'll have to go up and see. If it's, I should go in there too. Yeah. So she was, they gave her that award for being a trailblazer for the historians right, right. that would follow in her footsteps. And not only was she a historian, she was a preserver of history. She was. I, that's what I find, so, one of the things I find so admirable about her is 
preserving history, those primary sources and and that was what our that's what our vacations were when she would go and she would visit with people who had a pioneer journal and <clears throat> and she would convince them to let her borrow it mm -hmm. and then she would take it and the the Huntington Library would copy it and then she returned the original and a copy uh, and have a copy herself in their in handwriting and so um, there's a Juanita book section in the Library of Congress, you probably knew that. And, uh, and of course the work that she did for the Huntington Library in California. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was, she <clears throat> became very concerned about the fact that some of the Pioneer Diaries were not being uh, saved and that they were very, very precious history. And so, uh, yeah, she, she did a lot of, of that kind of work. As yes. Well. That I, I love primary sources, and that's what I'm interested in, yeah. so yeah. I'm grateful for that. If, um, what, did your mother have any words of wisdom or axioms that she lived by? We, uh, she had one that said, um, oh, let me see, how was it? You are a, something about you are a Brooks, when you leave this house you act accordingly. Um, you know that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, she was very very honest. She always stressed the fact that that uh, honesty was the best policy, and uh, and she was fair, but she was uh, uh, you know my brother was saying yesterday she always expected us to do the right thing. I didn't know the right thing. She didn't uh, expect to have any trouble. But I, the only only axiom I. I don't know, I can't, honesty is the best policy and everything. And uh, and also, uh, you're a member of the Brooks family, you act accordingly. So I like that. That was uh, uh, one that, when you left the house, uh, you don't forget who you are. So did you all act accordingly? Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, you know, I think pretty much, we were pretty good kids. Yeah. We were pretty good kids. Um, uh, my. My youngest brother is a very brilliant scientist, and of, of the four of us, uh, two of the brothers have PhDs, and one has a master's degree. And of course, I just got out of college, and that's all. But um, but you know, education was extremely important to her, and she wanted us all to be educated. And uh, as I said, we didn't ever think we were through till we. And then, of course, the boys didn't think they were through anyway. They went on. So they went on. Yeah. Wonderful. And two Dr. Brooks's. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So if your mother could have changed one thing about her life, what would it have been? Or maybe she wouldn't have, but is there anything she had to no, change? I just really don't know. Um, she thought her world had ended when her first husband died. In fact, she had such great faith that she really thought that they would not bury him. She really thought he was going to survive. And uh, and so that was a difficult thing for her. But as she was older and as we were grown up, she said, you know, as I look back, I think Henry Father took him for a reason. She said, if he had lived, I'd have been just a little housewife in Nevada and she said uh, because I had to get out because I had to support myself because I had to get an education it made it possible for me to do the things that she did in her life mm -hmm. and she said as difficult as that death was at the time <clears throat> that as she looked out that she really feels like it was what was supposed to be so we never know, and and I I don't know that she'd have, have changed anything. I, um, you know, that's hard for me to to say. Right. Um, she always seemed very happy in her role as a mother and uh, in her role as a teacher. And we were not aware of her role as a writer most of the time that we were growing up. Uh, we were aware of her interest in history. But uh, I really don't know that she would uh, would have changed anything. Uh, she felt very 
satisfied with the way that that had gone. And uh, I guess that, that we make the best of what we have, and I think that's what she did and felt, felt good about it. Which is a wonderful thing to it leave is. as a legacy. Yeah. Not wanting to change. Not wanting to change. I, because I, you were happy and content. I can't think of a thing personally that I think she would have wanted to change. As she got older, she did some traveling, you know, she came to visit us in England, mm -hmm. and she came to visit us in Hawaii, and uh, brought my grandmother, and, and uh, it, was a, it was a great thing, so she had a, a real zest for life. It was very sad for all of us when she got older and lost a lot of those abilities. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I, I know one of the most difficult times, at least from the biography that I read, um, one of the most difficult times of your mother's life was when the church asked her not to include John Lee, not to include in John Lee's biography that he had been uh, posthumously rebaptized. In your opinion, do you think that time period would have been the most difficult for her, or were there others of equal or greater intensity? Well, from my perspective, you know, we were young when the book was published, and uh, we were downtown, and people would say, oh, they're going to make a movie out of your mother's book, and it actually even came out in the paper, and, but, they were, but they didn't, and she would not allow it. Uh, she would not give them permission. But I think that it was, personally, I would think that it was more difficult for her when the book came out because the brethren were not happy about it. They did not want it done, and they didn't understand her reasoning for having to do it and, and wanting to do it. And so uh, just from my limited memory, I, mm -hmm. I think that that may have been more difficult than when they didn't want to have John D. Lee's okay. put back in. And But it was put in, and it was an important thing that it was put in. And, uh, when she felt strongly about something, she did it if she felt that it was mm -hmm. right, and uh, and it was, it was the right thing to do. And so, I I think that uh, the more difficult time was when the book came out, and and you know when some of the brethren called her in to talk to her, but none of them had ever read it. Oh, is that the Mountains Meadow? Uh, the Mountains uh, Meadow Massacre. Book? Okay, Massacre. But and so. She told them um, that if they would read it, then she would be happy to come back and talk to them. But she wasn't going to talk to them about it if they had not read it. And uh, of course, it's uh, played out in history that she was right mm -hmm. and that it was the right thing to do yep. and that the church uh, acknowledged it. It was a terrible black mark, but it was the right thing to do. Yes. And so, uh, but I don't, I don't think she would have um, I mean, she knew that it had to be done, so she did it anyway. And I think in the beginning, she might have feared for her church membership, uh, but they never did take any action against her. In her later life, when her mind started to go, she thought that they had, uh, but, but they never did. They never did. And throughout it all, from what I understand reading, she remained firm and faithful and steadfast through all of this she did. turmoil. She, she did. She, and fact, she taught Sunday school for years and years, and she was the very best Sunday school teacher next to my husband that I've ever had. <laughs> and, uh, uh, she was a, an excellent, excellent teacher. And um, you know, in those days, we gave two and a half minute talks, and she always uh, had wonderful talks for us. And, um, after the book came out, she didn't teach Sunday school anymore. And I think that she, you know, and of course it may have been just time to be released anyway, but, uh, but always, always. One thing about Levi's book that bothered us as a family a little, <clears throat> he made her sound like more of a rebel than she really was. And she was very, very grounded in the gospel, and she, um, she taught all of us those principles and it was important 
and when her son Ernie started to slip away, but his wife left him, uh, mm -hmm. she wrote him a very tender letter telling him that she knew that things were bad in his life, but not to, to throw away everything. And I think she used a, uh, don't throw away the baby with the bath water or yeah. <laughs> something, that example. And so um, we always felt that both she and dad were very firm, very stalwart and very strong. And if you look at their posterity, there are many bishops, many state mm -hmm. presidents. Um, my husband and I served as mission presidents and directors of the visitor center. And uh, you know, for anyone to say that there was any problem in our home with the gospel would be very untrue. It's the, it's so your dad and your mom remained steadfast and immovable. Right. And they left that legacy right. for their children and grandchildren. That's right. So they 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 basically left a, a testament of the gospel they, oh, by their lives. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I thought about counting up how many uh, how many bishops and how many uh, great leaders there are in our families, and uh, but I didn't take time to do it. But we have, uh, you know, uh, two of my brothers, all three of my brothers have served as bishops, my th real brothers, and uh, two of them have served in state presidencies. And my brother Kay spent 12 years in South America for the church. Oh, wow. He's, well, he went first as a attache for the, he was an FBI agent, and uh, then he went back as a mission president, and a temple president, and an MTC president, and a executive secretary to the area authority and and so you know he had a wonderful career in the government as well as in the church and uh, and so uh, and their children and our children we have bishops and our children and so you know so it all came from that and I can remember family prayer in our home uh, my dad would get in around the breakfast table and kneel until everybody got there. <laughs> Sometimes it took a long time <laughs> to get there. Uh -huh. but, uh, but it was, it was a very, I felt very gospel oriented. So they left their posterity a righteous oh, they, did. they did a, right, a righteous posterity. Uh, a very, very good. Very good people all the way through. Yes. So, what would your mom, or your mother, I should, what would your mother, um, what advice would she give um, to historians today or women today? Because as you said, she was a woman before her time. She yeah, really did she raise was. a trail. What would she, what would she tell me or other historians or other women? You know, uh, I don't know because she was able to do it so well. Uh, you know, we, uh, growing up, we never thought of her as anything except a mother, and yet she was doing all of these other things. And so I think she would tell uh, women today that, and if it is possible to do it, if you if you make your family your priority, and uh, and spend your time wisely, and. Uh, like I say, she did well because she didn't require a lot of sleep, mm -hmm. and so um, she could she could do things. But uh, I think uh, I think she would encourage. I know she would encourage uh, women to use their intellect and to make a difference in the world. I know she'd be pleased that our granddaughters are in college and uh, that the others are planning, you know, on going. And so I think that that's. Uh, we have 16 granddaughters and only seven grandsons, so. Oh, that's almost opposite of, <laughs> of them. Yes. And so, and so the, the girls are all uh, all doing well, and I think she would be pleased because that's uh, what she expected. Excellent. Thank you. We've talked a lot about your mom. Is there anything you'd like to say about your dad? Because you mentioned that one of the reasons why your mom was so amazing was because he supported her so completely. And that, that is there anything is, else we need to know about your really, dad? That is really, really true. My father was a dear, yeah, 
he really, really was an ideal husband for her. He really was. Because he allowed her and helped her and uh, did everything he could to make her successful. And uh, maybe the fact that he was older and, uh, and after a while he retired and he was able to support her in that way. But, but he, he was a very important part of her success. And, um, and I know that she realized that and she knew that. And um, he would get up and fix breakfast for us when she was gone. He would see that our chores were done when she was gone. Uh, he would make sure that our homework was done when she was gone. And he would uh, tuck us in bed at night with our prayers when she was gone. And uh, I think that's probably an important part of her success was, was his unconditional love and help for her. Right. And I think, um, I'm sure that Levi real, realized that too, but there are probably people who, you know, who didn't know that, um, that he was such a great man. He really was. Everybody in town loved him. He was, he was Uncle Will to the whole world. And um, he used to sit in the middle of the Dixie High School cheerleaders, <laughs> I mean, cheering section. Because, of course, our oldest brother was the coach. But, uh, and so he never missed the game. And, Everybody, he was Uncle Will to everybody. He was a very unusual, happy personality. When we were in Omaha just recently, my, our son got out uh, the book, Uncle Will Tells His Story, and was reading to us the last paragraph where he said that he may never make a lot of difference in the world except with his posterity. And he said, I guess we hope that they will. And uh, our son said, you look at his posterity and her posterity, and they are making a big difference in the world. They are. Yes. Our, our, our son is one of them. He's doing some really amazing things. And uh, my brother's also. And, and so things that will make a difference in the world. And the things that really matter. Yeah. yeah. So, would it be fair to say that you have been doubly blessed with two amazing parents? Oh, yes. Definitely. And I don't know whether because they were old <laughs> that made a difference, that they were not worried about a lot of the, you know, the frivolous things that sometimes young parents worry about. And, um, but we didn't know they were old, so that was fine. That was fine. They were both um, quite remarkable and sustained and helped each other. It was interesting because when mother was always so independent and so smart and so bright that we thought that when our dad died that she would be fine, you know, that, but she wasn't. She wasn't. She, she had depended on him a lot. And, and all of us were surprised at what a difficult transition it was for her when we lost our dad. Which is another sign of their good partnership. How much she loved him and missed him. Yeah. 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 What What do you think your mother would most like to be remembered for? If she could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Well, I'm probably her bravery in doing the Mountain Meadow Massacre. That was, a, that was a very frightening thing. It was a very difficult thing. And, and I really think that that was her signature work. I think that was what, uh, what made her stand out, you know? Uh, I really think it was. And so, uh, I don't know. What do you think, Pat? Well, I think she always thought more of her family than she did of her work, and so I think she would be say, I want to be remembered, be remembered because of my austerity and the fact that we didn't, were able to blend a yours, mine, and ours family successfully. I think that's what she would say. 
perfectly beautiful answers. Thank you. So what would you like your mom to be remembered for? Oh my goodness. I, had, I think she's remembered already in a lot of ways. It's very interesting to me as I look for her books on the internet. You know, they become rare books. And her little Christmas tree book, my son was looking $250, if you can even find one. And so, uh, so um, I, I, I would like her to be remembered as a very, oh, how shall I say? She was a very wonderful mother and uh, and yet she left a real legacy in in history for for the church and for uh, well for the whole Western history and uh, if you look at the books that she's written and the articles that she's written and her legacy to us as a family uh, the written legacy my father's story and her own story and my grandfather's both of my you know on both sides of the family uh, those are very important things for us and I I would like for her to be remembered as a, a stalwart faithful woman who lived her life the best that she could and and lived up to what she believed at all times I, and uh, whose quest for truth and honesty was uh, something that she pursued always and that she expected from those around her. So, I don't know. Thank you. Your Have husband's nodding. That was beautiful. Thank you. So this is the last question, but is there anything else you would like to share about your mother? Anything, anything at all? I think we've about covered one thing about her she was never comfortable with her personal appearance she always thought that she was plain and uh, but but she did not let that bother her and my off my father often went and bought her clothes she didn't like to shop uh, for for clothes and and she didn't like her teeth after she got Paul's teeth then she was a lot better Another thing about her was that she was very comfortable with herself. Uh, I can remember whoever came to our house at dinner time was invited to, to join us, and sometimes I would be embarrassed because she'd maybe have a pot of beans or, or you know, just something that was on her. Never ever did she apologize. She made everybody feel as if they were family and they were welcome to come, and and the story of her siblings, they all mentioned how they never ever bothered to tell her they were coming. They just showed up with all their kids and that uh, she always made them feel welcome. And uh, and so I, I think that that would be an interesting thing for people to know that she, she was very unassuming, but she was very comfortable in who she was. One thing I thought was interesting when, he, when her dad was the sheriff, talking about people showing up for dinner, they, her dad would come home and bring one of his prisoners or more for dinner. Oh. <laughs> and she was expected to feed them at the, at the family table. And some of the little kids that had run away from home, she had to bathe and, and take care of them. And, and so, yeah, that's right. She did. He did bring prisoners home to feed them. That was before my time. But he did. Yeah. Wow. Just like you said, compassionate. She, she really was. She really, really was unusual in that way. And, and, uh, and comfortable, like I say, she didn't care what we had. Everybody was welcome to it. So wonderful. It's good. Is there anything else? I don't, uh, oh, I can't think of anything else. You think of anything else? It's a wonderful interview. Very well done. Oh, well. That's thanks to you. Thank you for coming so much. I, I'm so glad you came. Well, thank you. I'm glad to. Uh, people recognize her as a wonderful historian and as a very bright intellect and as a great contributor, but 
come, you know, not the story at home. Yeah, the love and the compassion. Thank you yeah. so, so much. I don't know why. It's making me weepy. It makes me weepy too. <laughs> yeah, I know it's because you love your mom. Yeah. And yeah. Love doesn't diminish, does it? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. I was thinking today how long she's been gone. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. So, you know, and all our folks were so old when they married that that all of us are coming along into old age now. They'd have been really, really old. <laughs> so, so anyway. Could I ask one or two questions? Yes. Sorry. Um, I haven't read her uh, biography or autobiography, so I don't. I probably should know this, but. Um, what was her, was her maiden name Levitt? Yes, she was a Levitt, and then her first husband was a Pulsifer. Okay. And so, uh, And where did she grow up? She grew up in Bunkerville, Nevada. Bunkerville, Nevada. Okay. Little tiny, little tiny town, and, and when she was just a little girl, you know, they had a small school, and she was not old to go, to go to school, but she'd go sit in the back in the doorway and, uh, and uh, okay. all, the, all the time, so. And where did she go to college? She uh, she graduated from the Y, but they had a, a lady teacher come there to Bunkerville and train some of the girls to be teachers. Okay. And it was I don't know, it wasn't even a college. They just had, and she was one of the people that opened the world to mother um, to letters. And she had been a graduate of Columbia. And so that's why when Mother got the sabbatical, then she chose to go to Columbia because of this lady who had influenced her. And, and so your mother taught, she taught high school uh -huh. English. Well, she taught, in those days, the Dixie College was two years of high school and two years of college. Okay. And so she actually had upper division and lower division classes um, there. And did she go on for uh, for higher degrees? For she got she got her master's at Columbia University. Columbia. Okay. The Dixie College had a sabbatical and nobody else okay. wanted it, and so mm -hmm. she took it. And her little boy lived with her parents in Bunkerville while she was there, and uh, she went. It was a <clears throat> great adventure for her because she went all by herself on the train and she'd never been out of you know she'd been in California and around, but. Uh, uh, to be um, exposed to culture outside of the LDS environment was an interesting experience for her. And uh, the Carillon Bells, when she got there that night, played Lead Kindly Light, and, and that was one of the Levitt family songs. And so she said, she sat down and cried and said, I can do this, <laughs> I can do this. And so she was all by herself. And so, and you know, actually, she could have used the Mountain Meadow or a lot of other things as a dissertation for a PhD, but uh, but she does have three honorary doctor's degrees that were awarded to her. So, so and, uh, and you had talked about the the courage that it took to you know to write these books and do this kind of investigative research. What what pushed her? Prompted her. Well, Just, she knew. How did she become interested? She knew in that? that this grant was available through the Huntington Library, mm -hmm. and uh, she knew that people were vying for it, and it was going to be done. It was going. The research was going to be done, and she said, "If someone's going to do it, it should be someone who's a member of the church." And and she always said, and you probably read it where she said, "Nothing but the truth is good enough for my church," and so she vied for that. Uh, Huntington's fellowship and got got that in, uh, to write, to do the research, but it was going to be done by somebody, and she, okay. she felt like it should be done by her. And so the things that she found out, um, the, you know, definitely put Mormons of the time in an unflattering light. It was a horrible thing. Had, did she know something about that ahead of time, or is that things that she uncovered? Well, she she knew um, okay. the story is told, and you read it. Yeah, yeah, I it. Uh, when she was a young teacher down in Bunkerville, an old man sent for her, and he was on his deathbed, 
and he was crying about death and blood and but anyway he wanted to talk to her about that and before she could make time to go he had died and so that that was the beginning of her interest in that and uh, and then she felt like uh, like I say like it needed to be done by somebody who had a sympathetic eye but the, the uh, general authorities did not want it done and she felt like Don D. Lee had been treated unfairly and, uh, and of course he had been and so we attended Tad and I a meeting in 1999 was it or was it 2000? 99 in, in uh, Cedar City where they brought together members of the Fancher family from Arkansas and President Hinckley and Rex Peely, who was a descendant of John D. Lee, and also the president of BYU, and uh, and uh, Indian chief, and they had uh, a meeting there at Cedar City, um, a meeting of forgiveness, a meeting of uh, acknowledging fault, and um, we both said that it was probably the most spiritual meeting we'd ever ever attended, and. Uh, we felt like at that time that it was laid to rest. And, you know, Mother went back when she was doing the research and visited the Arkansas people. She went to their mm -hmm. family reunion. Mm -hmm. We almost worried for her safety, but uh, it, it turned out to be a very good thing. It turned out to be a very good thing. So, And of course, John D. Lee was then restored and in the church, and, and his descendants uh, have great honor and love mother and, yep. and, and many of them have done great things too the Lee family and so the Udalls in Arizona who are legislators and in the government all descended from John D. So. And are you related to Levitt, Mike Levitt's family, the yes. governor? Yes, okay. Mike Levitt and his father Dixie Levitt. Mm -hmm. um, we had the same great-grandfather, but I think we had a different great-grandfather. Oh, okay. I was descended from the third wife of W. Levitt, and uh, I think they came from one of the first wives, didn't they? I think they it was Sarah Studevert Levitt. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah Studevert Levitt is who they came Yeah, well, we all come from Sarah Studevert. Oh, okay. Now, Sarah Studevert Levitt is the grand matriarch. Okay, okay. And, and then you come, and she yeah. had 12 children. And my great grandfather Dudley Levitt was one of them, but Dudley Levitt had five wives. Okay. And he married two sisters, and then he married my grandmother, and then he married an Indian girl that almost broke up all the marriages. But they, but the brethren told him he had to marry her. So anyway, and then he took a fifth wife, whose husband had died, and they didn't ever have any children. But, uh, but he had a, he had a. And he was a very good example of polygamy. There are, my great grandmother on the Haven side was not a very good example of polygamy, but, but Dudley Levitt was very fair. Every shoe that he bought for one, he bought for all. If he bought a bowl of cloth for one, he bought one for everybody. They each had their own home, and, uh, and his children worshiped him. And uh, so he's an example, of, a good example of, of polygamy. And uh, my grandmother, Hapen, was taken down to Bunkerville and left, and her husband went once a year to get her pregnant about. And, and anyway, she fended for herself. And, and she never did say anything about him, badly about him, but he was the bishop in Santa Clara for 27 years, and so he didn't have time for another family down there, but anyway, Dudley Level was a good example of What did your father do? My father, uh, 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 he was a sheriff in uh, Washington County, and then uh, he was the postmaster okay. in the post office. And, sorry, uh, I said. and then when he was forced to retire at 70, whatever it was, then he managed a motel. We had a motel, and, and uh, managed a motel. And you grew up in? St. George. St. George, okay. Yeah. All right. All of us grew up in St. George. Okay. Yeah. He loved running a motel because he loved people. Oh, yes. He had a great time 
greeting people. And we were only there, it was the year I was junior in high school, and we were only there for a couple of years. But uh, that was at the time all of us had to help clean the rooms. And it was, it was a good time for him, so yeah. it was lots of fun. Well, it's been fun to kind of reminisce. I haven't, you know, I haven't uh, thought but about it. Thank you for coming. It's been, it's been really nice. Well, thank you. I, you know, I thought about my brothers. I think I told you that two of them are in the early stages of Alzheimer's. I'm the oldest, and uh, and the one brother um, who lives in Kenwick, Washington, is still very bright. He has done very really well, so. But, but as we talked about it, we felt like it might be better just. It was perfect. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much.